This is the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Greetings, friends, and welcome to the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. This is episode number 36, entitled Agency and God's Agents in the New Testament. The Biblical Unitarian Podcast is the podcast that aims to start conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. Thanks so much for joining us today. My name is Dustin Smith, and I am your host. In our last episode, we noted how the God of the Bible used his creation as vessels through whom his divine interaction and blessings would flow. This was observed in the Old Testament, where it was clear that God often invested his name, his authority, his attributes, and his rule in his creation, both in human beings and in angels. When God invested his name, authority, attributes, and rule in these commissioned agents, it did not result in these empowered agents becoming the Lord God himself. Rather, they were understood as authorized agents, representing the Lord God, without infringing upon God's oneness and monotheism. Nor were these human figures or these angels thought of as having been included into the Godhead in any way, shape, or form. No, they functioned as agents and operated within the principle of agency, extending the influence of the only true God further into his world. Since the previous episode gave examples from the Old Testament, it is now appropriate to turn to the New Testament to see if God continues to empower agents in the same manner. Of course, the relevance for New Testament Christology and understanding the relationship between God and Jesus, whom God has sent, is quite clear when it comes to this principle of agency. But there are other occurrences where, as we will soon see, other human beings are empowered as God's authorized agents in a similar manner. If the only true God was able to invest his authority in human agents within the Old Testament without infringing upon his oneness as God, and if the same phenomena can be observed within the New Testament, then Jesus Christ as the sent agent of God would likewise keep unaltered the oneness and unity of God rather than suggesting that Jesus is a person within the Godhead. So let's begin. Our first point today is that God invests his ability to forgive sins in his agents. We're going to start with a passage in Matthew chapter 9. We're going to read the first eight verses. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 1 says this. Getting into a boat, Jesus crossed over the sea and came to his own city. And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, Then he said to the paralytic, get up, pick up your bed, and go home. And he got up and went home. And when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. That's Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Here is an example where very clearly Jesus has been given the authority to forgive sins. The question is not whether God actually is able to give this authority to Jesus. It's whether Jesus truly had that authorization from God, whether he was one who blasphemed or whether indeed God had given this authority to men. Because within this story, we have some of the scribes saying that Jesus blasphemes, but we have the crowds awestruck, giving glory to God who had authentically given this authority to forgive sins to Jesus Christ. So there is a split within the opinion of those who were present who saw this particular miracle. Jesus states that he has the authority to forgive sins on earth because he is the Son of Man 
in verse 6. He doesn't say that he has the authority to forgive sins because he is the Lord God himself or because he is the second person of the Trinity. No, it's because God has invested his authority to forgive sins into this authorized agent, specifically Jesus as the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a title for the human judge that God sends to enact God's judgment. And of course, the judgment of God is certainly something that can forgive sins or to hold sins accountable. So what we're seeing in this passage is that God, as what we see in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 8, has given the authority not to just a single man, but to men, to plural men, and that's what the Greek says, to the plural of anthropos, to anthropis, to multiple human beings. God has given the authority to forgive sins, and this ultimately brings the glory to God himself. Jesus here is someone who has the authority to forgive sins. But of course, we have known throughout the religion of Israel, throughout Judaism, that God has also given the authority to forgive sins to the high priest, who also was a human being who represented God. No one thought that the high priest was God himself. They knew that the high priest was a human being whom God has empowered to forgive sins. We can also see in the New Testament that the disciples, the early disciples, were also given the authority to forgive sins. In John chapter 20, verse 23, Jesus tells the disciples that if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. That's in John 20, verse 23. Jesus there very clearly is saying that the disciples were also human beings had the authority to forgive sins. Very clearly, the ability to forgive sins doesn't necessarily make someone God. If you're a human being that is forgiving sins, then you are someone who has been authoritatively given this right and this privilege. So Jesus can forgive sins, the high priest can forgive sins, the disciples can forgive sins, and we have an interesting text in the Dead Sea Scrolls that came out of the fourth cave, the document 4Q, Prayer of Nab, passage 4, states that an exorcist, a human exorcist, was also able to forgive sins. Just kind of an interesting point that outside the Bible, there was still this realization within Second Temple Judaism that authorized human beings could forgive sins. So we have four examples there, Jesus, the high priest, the disciples, and the exorcist within the Dead Sea Scroll community there in Qumran. So that demonstrates our first point, that God can invest his ability to forgive sins within his agents. Our second point today is that God can invest his authority in those whom he sins. I want to limit our study in this particular point to the Gospel of John, and what we're going to look at is that there are instances in the Gospel of John to where people are sent from God. And it uses a very specific phrase in Greek, para theu, which is the preposition para used with a genitive noun. Theu is the genitive of God, of theos. And so there, this particular phrase of being sent from God is used, we're going to see here, of two human beings. The first one is going to be John the Baptist. In John chapter 1 and verse 6, we see that there was a man sent from God, and his name was John. This is John the Baptist here in John chapter 1 and verse 6. John the Baptist is introduced as a human being who was sent from God. Sent from God. Not just sent by God, but sent from God indicating that God has authoritatively sent this human being. Nobody thinks that John the Baptist was located in heaven at the point of this particular sending. No, we know that John the Baptist was the descendant of Elizabeth and his father, Zacharias. John the Baptist was a human being, but to be sent from God indicated that God had authorized fully this particular person as his authorized agent, and John the Baptist surely functioned as a premier prophet, making the way for Jesus and his ministry. So for John the Baptist to be sent from God did not indicate 
nor imply that John the Baptist existed in heaven at the point of his sending. No, to be sent from God, with this particular phrase, meant that God had given the authority and the authorization to this particular person. And of course, John the Baptist here is stated in John 1, 6 as a human being sent from God. What we can see is that this phrase, sent from God, with the preposition para followed with the genitive, is used two other places in the Gospel of John. These are all three occurrences that we're looking at in our study today. And the other two occurrences are in reference to Jesus Christ. In John chapter 9, verses 16 through 17, we read the following. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he is a prophet. That's John chapter 9, verses 16 through 17. There we see again a difference of opinion regarding whether Jesus was truly authorized by God. We have the Pharisees on the one hand saying that Jesus, who by the way, they admit is a human being, this man is not from God, is not sent from God, specifically because Jesus doesn't keep the Sabbath in the way that the Pharisees think the Sabbath should be kept. Okay, So notice here, the issue is whether or not Jesus as a human being truly is sent by God and that this question is resolved as to whether or not this person does things that a authorized prophet would actually do. Would an authorized prophet from God be keeping the Sabbath in the way that the Pharisees understood it? Or would he be doing it in some sort of lackadaisical and casual way? The others, as we see in John 9, 16, recognize that Jesus did perform signs. He did perform miraculous signs. So as an authorized prophet sent from God, he could perform authentic signs empowered by God. Of course, the blind man who was healed by Jesus the prophet, who demonstrated this miraculous sign, indicated that Jesus truly was a prophet. So notice there, for Jesus to be sent from God in John 9, 16, had nothing to do with the destination that Jesus was at the moment of his sending. It had nothing to do or had no sort of implication that Jesus existed in heaven at the point of his sending. No, for Jesus to truly be sent from God, he had to do the things that God wanted him to do. He had to authentically demonstrate true signs, and he had to function as a prophet, very similar to what we saw with John the Baptist. John the Baptist functioned as an authorized prophet from God, and the phrase from God, being sent from God, had nothing to do with some sort of destination in heaven. Jesus here is also a man sent from God, just like John the Baptist was a man sent from God. Third passage here is in John chapter 9 and verse 33, to where the people are saying, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. That is the, the crowds. They are saying there in John 9.33 that if Jesus, by the way, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To be sent from God had nothing here to do with the previous destination. It had no implication that Jesus previously existed in heaven at the point of his sending. No, in order for someone to be sent from God in this particular context, it indicated that that person could actually do something empowered by God. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. It had everything to do with what this person authoritatively sent by God could actually perform. It was about what God had invested this agent to authentically do rather than have any sort of bearing on the location of that agent when he was sent. So in all three of these occurrences, in John 1, 6, in John 9, verses 16 through 17, and in John 9, 33, where all three of the occurrences of someone being sent paratheu from God within the Gospel of John, they all indicate that to be sent from God meant that God had invested his authority in the person whom he has sent. It had nothing to do with any sort of preexistence or the fact that the prophet might 
exist in heaven. That, that was not the point. That it had nothing to do with what this phrase meant. In order to be sent from God within the Gospel of John, that meant that God had invested his authority into this agent, and both of these agents, John the Baptist and Jesus, are described in these passages as human figures, as human beings. They are human beings whom God has invested his authority as prophetic figures and they could speak the words of God, and they could perform miracles in God's name. There we see John the Baptist was sent from God, Jesus was sent from God, and you can look in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, and you can find that dozens and dozens of prophets were sent by God, and none of these persons originated in heaven in any sort of way. Our third point today is that God invests his name into his agents, God investing his name into his human agents. We have a very powerful and important passage here in Philippians 2, the Philippian hymn. And in Philippians 2, 8 through 11, we read this. Jesus, talks about Jesus, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and here's the key point, God bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's Philippians 2, 8 through 11. There we see that Jesus was obedient to the point of death, death on the cross, and because of Jesus' obedience, God raised him from the dead, and God highly exalted him. And at this resurrection and exaltation, God gave to Jesus, he bestowed upon Jesus, God's own name, God's own authoritative name. And this is the name that is above every name. Okay, God has invested and given his own name into Jesus, and not just at any particular time, but Jesus at his resurrection and exaltation. It's the resurrected and exalted Jesus who bears God's own name, God's name which is above every name. And notice, what does it mean that Jesus bears the name of God? It means that, as we see there in Philippians 2.10, that Paul can take a passage, this passage where it says, every knee will bow. That is a passage from Isaiah chapter 45, verse 23, which is a passage about the Lord God. It's a passage about the Lord God receiving allegiance and that every knee is going to bow to the Lord God. Let's actually read that passage. Isaiah 45 and verse 23, God says, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness and will not turn back, that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. That's Isaiah 45 and verse 23. What Paul is able to do is that Paul sees that at the resurrection and exaltation of Jesus, the Lord God, God the Father, has invested his own name, his authoritative name, onto the resurrected and exalted Jesus to the point to where passages from the Old Testament about the Lord God can now be used and attributed to the resurrected and exalted human being Jesus. Why? Not because Jesus is the Lord God, but because God has invested his authoritative name, the name that's above every name, onto Jesus. God shares his name, God shares his authoritative name with Jesus as an exalted human being. That's why this passage, which originally was about the Lord God, is now given to Jesus. Again, just to make clear for the listeners, for Paul to use this passage about the Lord God in the Old Testament, in reference to Jesus now, is not to say that Jesus is the Lord God. No, it's to say that God has given and shared his authoritative name with Jesus, and thereby a passage like this, which formerly was about the Lord God, is now shared and invested in the Lord Jesus, the risen and exalted Lord Jesus. And then we can see the caveat that Paul himself gives to this particular point. We see it there in 2.11, where it says, Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Remember, God the Father gave 
and bestowed his authoritative name onto Jesus. And this means that while people are confessing the lordship of Jesus and they're giving allegiance to Jesus and every tongue is swearing allegiance to Jesus and bowing their knee to Jesus, this is ultimately to the glory of God the Father. God the Father gets the ultimate glory in this whole thing because God has shared his name with the human being Jesus. This helps explain, in my opinion, how the most exalted titles given to Jesus actually appear after his resurrection within the New Testament. You'll note that the most exalted things that are said about Jesus, the most exalted titles that the writers of the New Testament give to Jesus are given to Jesus after his resurrection. So things like John 20, 28, where Jesus is called my Lord and my God, that's after the resurrection. How can that be true? Well, it's because at the resurrection of Jesus, God has bestowed his name upon Jesus. We can see that some of the exalted titles in the book of Revelation are very exalted. Some of the titles that are given to Jesus sound like titles that the Lord God should have by himself. But this is because God has shared his authoritative name with Jesus. And so Jesus can bear these titles as an authorized agent, thus demonstrating our point that God invests his name into his agents. So, in conclusion, we have observed that, number one, within the New Testament, God has demonstrated that he can share his ability to forgive sins with human beings. Jesus demonstrated the ability to forgive sins and stated that the reason he was able to forgive sins was because he was the authorized son of man. Even the crowds agreed that God had given this authority to human beings, and the New Testament also states that the early disciples were given the authority to forgive sins as well. Number two, we saw that God can also share his authority with human beings, as was demonstrated by the Gospel of John, where both Jesus and John the Baptist were described as having been sent from God. The meaning of this phrase in Greek indicated that the agent whom God has truly sent bore the authority of God as an authorized prophet figure and had nothing to do with the agent's prior location at the time of sending. In other words, being sent from God did not imply that the agent existed in heaven at the moment of his sending. And number three, we saw that God can share his name with his agents. And the best example of this is at the resurrection and exaltation of the human Jesus, where God bestowed upon him his unique name. This allowed Paul to attribute an Old Testament passage of Scripture about the allegiance to the Lord God onto this newly empowered Jesus, while still giving the readers the caveat that confessing the lordship of Jesus was ultimately to the glory of God the Father. If you enjoy the Biblical Unitarian Podcast and you would like to give back to the work that it is doing, please check out this episode's description for a PayPal link. Thank you so much for listening today. My name is Dustin Smith, and until next time, you take care.